and uh, and keep you know as you can keep helping out and of course pray uh, you know that God would lead us and guide us allow us to be able to have the uh, facility that would suit our needs all right amen now we're we're in Hebrews five right before we start I got a joke for you I heard a I heard a joke and I don't know, sometimes things just hit me and make me laugh like crazy. And they're probably not that funny, but it just, you know, something just hits you and you laugh like crazy. Um, <laughs> someday I'll tell you another story. Not right now, but um, I heard a joke. There's a, there was a farmer decided to, he lived out in the country in Tennessee, and he, he decided to go to uh, Memphis and visit some uh, friends and uh, some family that lived there and of course this this farmer he lived on a farm and he had a lot of animals and he had this one pig that was like his pal and he even named the pig Arthur and he took Arthur and jumped in his truck and Arthur was sitting in the in the front seat of the truck in the passenger side and they took off and they're driving on down the highway to Memphis and as they're driving on the highway a cop notices the pig with his head out the window and he pulls up behind him, stops him, comes over, you know, asks us for his registration, his license. He says, farmer says, officer, what's, what's, what's the matter? He says, well, don't you know that it's against the law to be driving down the highway with a pig in your passenger seat sticking his head out the window? And the farmer says, oh, I, I didn't know that. Gee, you're going to write me a ticket? He says, no, here's what we're going to do. You're going to promise me that you take that pig right to the zoo when you get to Memphis. He said, officer, you got it. Thank you so much. So they leave, and they go on their way. A few days passed. Two, three days later, officer's doing his you know, highway patrol, and all of a sudden, there goes a truck, and there's the farmer and Arthur driving down the highway. <laughs> Cop says, this guy, don't, this guy don't learn a lesson. Pulls up behind him, pulls him over, walks up. Says, you know, I know you. He says, you're the guy I stopped the other day. And he said, didn't I tell you to take that pig to the zoo when you got to Memphis? Farmer says, yeah, officer. When we had such a good time, I'm taking him to Six Flags. I don't know, it just, it sounded better the first time. It was just, it just hit me. <laughs> All right, Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. All right, now, let's just get ourselves centered on what we're talking about. We're talking about the snares of Satan. Dangers to the spiritual life. We, we've already noted from our study in Jacob that once the grace of God gets a hold of you, the grace of God will never let go of you. No sin and no failure on the part of a believer can ever cause him to lose his relationship with God. God may have to chastise us and sometimes chastise us severely, but no mistake, no sin, no failure, no poor judgment, no fear, no doubt, no struggle that the believer has can separate them from the love of God. The idea that you can lose your salvation is a false doctrine. It's not in Scripture. And it's because of a misunderstanding of certain passages that talk about losing rewards. You can lose rewards. You can lose blessing. You can lose joy and peace and testimony and power. But you can never lose salvation. That is a gift of God's grace. And once God starts working in your life, He'll always be working. And His grace is always available, but here's the problem. Satan is also working, and he's also working to nullify our spiritual growth and our effectiveness for Christ. Satan wants to destroy and ruin our spiritual life. So he sets snares, and a snare is what? It's a trap. Now, if you were walking down a path in the woods and you saw a, a trap, a bear trap, or some other type of trap, and you saw it, you'd walk around it, you'd avoid it, right? But if you didn't see it, if it was covered up, grass or leaves or branches, very good possibility you'd step right in it, right? Because you unwittingly would caught in it. Well, Satan has all kinds of traps 
all kinds of snares to nullify Christian spiritual growth. He knows he cannot take away our salvation because that's the gift of God's grace. The foundation of God stands sure and has this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. We can't lose that salvation. It's a gift of his grace. But he wants to render our lives miserable and ineffective for the Lord. And he takes great delight in that and that's why he sets snares. And uh, we began looking last week at some of those snares that Satan will use in our lives to hinder our spiritual growth. And the first one that we pointed out, number one, in the snares of Satan, and this is a very important point, is that he convinces believers to remain spiritual, that's an abbreviation, babes, right? He convinces believers to remain spiritual babes, not to earnestly pursue spiritual growth in their life. Now, let me explain something. You don't grow by prayer. You don't grow by witnessing. You don't grow by serving. You don't grow by giving. You grow by learning the Word of God and apply it to your life. And if you learn the Word of God and apply it to your life, then you'll have a great prayer life. You'll have, be able to witness. You'll be able to serve and discover your gift. And you'll be able to give generously and liberally. You see? Those things do not cause growth. Those things are the fruits of growth. You understand what I'm saying? And it's very important to understand this. And Satan creates these snares to try to hinder the believer's life. And the first and foremost, we got, we're going to look at ten. But first and foremost on this list is getting believers to not take their spiritual growth seriously. Okay? Many believers, on the Old Testament, Hosea said, my people suffer for lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge of what? Of God, of His Word, of His principles, of His promises, of the doctrines of His Word. Many believers do not take God's word seriously enough. And, in, and when they do take it seriously enough, they hear it only casually without focus. Let me keep a, keep a pen in Hebrew 5 and just flip quickly to Romans 12. I want to show you something. Go back to Romans 12. And we're starting here at a very fundamental principle to the spiritual life. Last week I showed you how that you cannot grow in the Christian life unless you are in a local church with a prepared pastor. You cannot live the Christian life as an island unto yourself. God does, did not design the Christian life, the plan of God for spiritual growth, in such a way as you to be able to live as an island unto yourself. He gave the local church, and the scripture says he gave the prepared pastor. Not any pastor and not any church. A local church where the grace of God is taught, not a legalistic assembly or an assembly where apostasy and false doctrine is taught, but a, where the grace of God is taught, the word is rightly divided by a pastor who is gifted and prepared and promoted by God to teach the word of God, the whole counsel of God. That's how you grow. And you learn your word from your prepared pastor. In addition, you read the Bible on your own, absolutely. But just reading the Bible on your own, you are not going to be able to get all the doctrines and principles that you need for your spiritual growth. That's why it says, and he gave pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, to the building up of the body of Christ. So I'm challenging you today to recognize this local assembly. If you're here, it's probably where God wants you. And to realize that if you're here, this is probably the pastor God wants you to learn from. And to show up regularly, as often as you can. And when you can't, for legitimate reasons, legitimate reasons, pick up some tapes and CDs or get on the internet and study the Word of God with your prepared pastor. This is God's plan for our spiritual growth. And then, of course, not only do we need to learn the Word, but we need to what? Apply it. Now look at Romans chapter 12, look at verse 2. Verse 2, it says... And be not conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed. That means changed. And how we get what well, God wants to change us into, wants to make us like Christ. But how do you change? You've got to get the what? Mind straightened out. You don't change by trying to clean yourself up on the outside. 
The flesh cannot change the flesh. You need to what? Renew your mind, your thinking. The scripture says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he what? Is. What you need to do is you need to fill your mind and your thoughts with the word of God. Because look what it says. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. That you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now let me tell you something. If you do not take your spiritual growth seriously on a daily basis, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If you do not take your spiritual growth seriously on a daily basis, and I know there's days where stuff just goes that we can't get to the Word of God, but if you look at the whole picture, predominantly every day you ought to get something of the Word of God from your prepared pastor, okay? Or from good materials, all right? To enable your mind to be renewed. You hearing what I'm talking about? And we make everything available for free, so there's absolutely no excuse. I'm free from the blood of all of yous. In other words, if you mess up your spiritual life, it's not on this guy. Amen. It's on you. Because I got over 1,800 hour, hours of tapes and CDs, books, internet, television, you name it. If you don't take advantage of it, shame on you. Okay? Amen. Now, but it says that renew your mind. Because listen, folks, this is what it comes down to. How am I going to respond in life there are all kinds of situations that arise. And you know, in every situation that we find ourselves in, whether it's marriage, children, work, financial problems, tests, obstacles, hurts, pains, difficulties, etc., God, God has a will and a way for us to respond. But you know, if we're not growing, we're not going to be responding right to these situations. And it always comes down to because we haven't taken the Word of God seriously enough. See, some people, when they listen to the Word of God, they come to church often and they listen, but they're not listening intently and seriously and concentratingly and focused. And they're not letting it sink into their soul and, and then thinking about it later and meditating on it and let it really get deep. It's just a casual listening. So then they wonder why when they're faced with tests and trials, they're full of fear. They're stressed out. They're always responding to situations with emotion, anger, anxiety, fleshly ways, bitterness, malice, jealousy. It's because they're still carnal. They're still a babe. Yeah, you may be in church a lot and you may hear a lot of what? Preaching and a lot of doctrine, but it's the way that you're listening that is causing you to really be dull of hearing and you're not absorbing. You know, when you eat, you have to chew your food good, swallow it, and let it what? Digest. Right? There's people that are, they call them, what, uh, what's that word, anorexic or bulimic, and they, they'll chew, eat, swallow, and then they'll stick their fingers in their mouth and vomit it back up. There's a lot of Christians like that. They're going to hear a lot of messages, but when they walk out these four walls, there's no concentration and meditation and serious desire to grow and focus on what was said. And so the first time they meet an obstacle or a challenge or a problem, right away they vomit up everything they what? Just digested of the Word of God in the spiritual sense. You understand what I'm talking about? And what takes over? Emotion, fear, anger, bitterness, malice, jealousy, stress, the whole, the whole nine yards. Okay? Because let me tell you something. Be Catholic. When you come to church, you ought to be serious about God's Word. When you're at home and you're going to sit down and read the Bible, you ought to be serious and quiet and focused. It ought to be the most important moments of your day, time of your day. You're meeting with God. You shouldn't be casual and frivolous and distracted and silly. Because if you are, you'll remain a spiritual babe. When you get when I'm home alone with the Bible study and I put everything else aside, off goes the television, the radio, everything, distractions, lock myself in the room, shut the door. People come and knock on my door. You pastor home? Pastor home? I give them, ain't nobody home but us cows. Get out of here. <laughs> Don't bother me. I shut the phone off. Don't bother me. I'm meeting with my God. 
Because it's important to me. It's more important, that, as Job said, than my what? Necessary food. Now, don't raise your hand, play poker, don't ask yourself, do I have that kind of attitude about God's word? Or am I just kind of casually listening? Because if you're casually listening, guess what? It's not absorbing deep. And then you wonder why you keep repeating the same old bad habits, the same old fearful, anxious, doubtful, worrying, stress-filled, bitter, jealous responses to life and the things you face. Because you ain't hearing right. Your heart ain't right to begin with when you're hearing. Yeah, you're exposing yourself to it, but you're really not. You get in the picture? And you will remain a spiritual baby. Folks, this is serious stuff that we do when we gather. Yeah, we have a good time, but this is serious. And it demands the utmost concentration. And Satan wants to convince us not to take our spiritual growth seriously. Now get over to Hebrews chapter 5. Be careful how you hear the word of God. Hebrews chapter 5, because we have an example here of a, be a group of Jewish believers who were in danger of apostasy. We have a group of Jewish believers who were in danger of apostasy. You say, what's apostasy? Apostasy means to fall away from the what? Faith. During the week, we have been discussing, now see, this is why it's important to keep up with the Word of God. We have been discussing during the week from Corinthians the possibility and the danger of spiritual failures in the Christian life. And we've been looking at examples from the New Testament of believers who were saved but became shipwrecked in their faith, who had their faith overthrown. Some of them who died the sin unto what? Death. Others who suffered severe chastisement. Others who just kind of went through the motions of being a Christian. Went to church a little bit. Said a prayer now and then. Maybe did something spiritual once in a while. But their heart was focused on what? The world and the things of the world. The parable says the details of what? Life. In Hebrews chapter 8 verse 14. Some Christians become so shipwrecked they give up the public testimony. They're not in church anymore. They're not doing anything in the spiritual life. They're, sh they're shot, wounded, and about to die. And some of them do go home to be with the Lord early. Okay? And others just live out their life saved as by fire. And then there's those who are in church, but it's not serious to them. They'll go out of just what? Ritual, tradition. And they'll listen to some sermons. But it ain't sinking in or doing anything. Their mind is in the world. They're absorbed with the world. Their focus is the world. The details of life. Satan has ensnared them. They're in church. They carry a Bible. They use the name of Jesus. And they're saved. And we thank God they're precious. They believed on the Lord. But the world is their focus. And they're in Satan's snare, and they don't even know it. And all their Christian life amounts to is just kind of going through the motions. And that's sad, because they're saved as by what? Fire. And now we have a situation here in Hebrews chapter 5, we're going to begin, with Jewish believers got saved. And they were on fire for the Lord when they first got saved. They were zealous for the Lord when they first got saved. They willingly suffered all kinds of persecution for the Lord and it didn't matter to them because they know in heaven I got a great what? Reward awaiting. But as time went on, they got tired and they got weary with the struggle and the battle. And this can happen to Christians. Just because you're a Christian in God's grace is no guarantee that you will live a victorious, successful Christian life and finish the race. That's why Paul said at the end, ah, I finished the race. There's a what? Reward. And he said, I run my race so that I may obtain the prize. And he said to us, you run that you might obtain the prize. And he talked about how he kept himself disciplined and under self-control and kept his focus on what? Christ. Because he knew the possibility of being a castaway, of losing what? 
reward of failing to finish the race, missing out on the blessing God had down here, the growth, the joy, the peace, the power, the testimony, the effectiveness for Christ, and the reward when he stands before the Lord someday. Spiritual growth is the beginning of everything. So this is not a message to get out and start doing something. This is, a, as far as work, 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 this is a message about starting to focus and grow. And how do you do that? By learning the Word of God in a local church with your pastor. That's how you start it. That's God's plan. That's New Testament. If you ain't doing that, brother and sister, why not? You can do things that you want to. Amen. You can always make an excuse not to do things that you don't want to. But if God says the only way you're going to grow is by learning his word from your prepared pastor in a local church and regularly doing that to renew your what? Mind. Why do you think that you can know better than God? Or why has Satan convinced you that it's not important? to be there. That other stuff is more important. And if you can't be there for legitimate reasons, why don't you pick up the information and keep up? We've got folks here that work. They work hard. They can't be here all the time. But boy, I, I'm thrilled with them when I see them over at that tape rack, keeping up every week, or CDs. They're going to be all right. They're going to be okay. We've got folks that travel from afar, quite a distance. I don't want to embarrass them, but I'm impressed by some folks who come from great distances and have to, you know, and some of them don't drive. They've got to take buses and stuff to get here. And we've got other folks that got all the convenience in the world and live around the corner and can't get up and get to church. That's your business. Don't do it. Hey, that's your thing. Don't do it. Don't do it for me. Do it for your what? Self. For your own spiritual growth. And take the word of God serious when you can't be here. Keep up. I could preach this a thousand times and some folks just never get it. And be careful how you hear because these Hebrew Christians had now gotten vulnerable. They're weary. They're tired. And we're going to note in this passage that it wasn't that they weren't hearing the word of God. It was that they became dull of hearing. They were sitting in church. They were there while the message is being preached. But it wasn't being absorbed into their spirit. And they were in danger of falling away and apostatizing. And going back to Judaism. And offering a sacrifice in the temple of a lamb. Just not to be bothered and persecuted. Because at this point they were being ostracized from the Jewish community. They were being disowned by their families for their faith in Christ. So if they were to go to temple and offer a sacrifice, that would be all relieved. You see? You see? And they were hearing the word, but the problem was not that they weren't hearing it, it was how they were hearing it. It was not having an impact on them anymore. They became dull of hearing. You see, I can preach till I'm blue in the face and preach accurate and clear and spirit-anointed messages, but they will not touch your heart unless your heart is in the right condition. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? And that's the battle. This is a message about keeping your heart in the right condition and your focus on God and His Word and not being distracted by the things of the world so that you become dull of hearing. Yeah, you're going to church, you're doing stuff, but you're just going through the motions. It's not having an impact that's lasting on you. And you don't even know you're in Satan's snare. It's possible. Because the devil deceives the whole what? World. world. Hebrews chapter 5. <laughs> Look at verse 11. Now he's speaking about Jesus. It says, Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. Ooh, boy, do I know what you're talking about, Paul. I got a lot of stuff to say. But sometimes I'm talking to certain people, not when I'm preaching, but when I'm talking to people individually, 
And I realize that I got stuff to say, but there's no way they can hear it. Oh, I can say it. They'll hear an audible voice, but they won't really hear the content of what I'm trying to tell them. Why? They've become dull of hearing. Their heart is not in the right condition. They cannot receive the word of God that's being said to them because their focus is everywhere else except God and his word. They're not taking their spiritual growth seriously. They may have taken it seriously at one time, but now they become dull of hearing. You know, it's amazing when you talk to people or counsel them, they come in to dump their problems on you. And I start talking about the word of God and the answers to the, they don't want to hit that. They want me to fix their problem. I can't fix your problem. Only God can fix your problem. And the only way that's going to happen is you start to believe his word. You know, it's like when Nicodemus came to, to Jesus. And Lord, uh, we know that, you know, you're a teacher come from God because nobody could do these miracles, uh, you know. But you know what? Jesus knew his real need. He said, Nicodemus, unless a man's born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Jesus said, don't be amazed that I said ye must be born again. Oh, are you a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? I've told you earthly things, you don't understand that. How shall you understand what? Heavenly things. In other words, Nicod Jesus knew what the problem was. And he was giving Nicodemus the answer. But Nicodemus could not what? Hear it. You see? Christians get like this, folks. Saved but dull of hearing. Now look here. Gee, he, he said, verse 11, Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered. Why are they hard to be uttered? Because when you're trying to get something through to somebody that they need to hear, but their heart ain't right and they can't receive it, it's like you have to force it out of your mouth and even then you know it's falling on deaf what? Is. They're hearing words, but they're not really hearing what you're saying. You've been there. You know that. Maybe not with the word of God, but maybe with other stuff. Right? They grew cold. They grew bored with doctrine. There was things out in the world that was more exciting than church. More exciting than serving the Lord. They got caught up in it. Or they just got tired of what? The struggle. Right? There's a couple ways the devil can get at us, right? Well, there's a lot of ways, but we, we could get weary with the struggle or we could just get so excited with something out there in the world. But either way, we become what? Dull of hearing and we're going just through the motions. And he said, look, you're dull of hearing. Verse 12, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become as such as have need of milk and not strong what? Meat. For everyone that useth the milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he or she is a what? Babe. <laughs> Paul said, You have regressed. You see? You should be teachers by now. And he didn't mean pastor teachers, but he meant you ought to be able to teach others about what? Your faith. You should have answers. You should know the word of God. And yet, I've got to go back and start from what? The first principles, the basics again. Because you're still babies. You've gone backwards. You're becoming dull of hearing. You're hearing, but you're not hearing. You're dull of hearing. Dull of hearing means, you know there's some noise coming out of that guy's mouth, but it's like, wah, 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 wah. I hear the noise, but I don't hear what he's saying. You see? And it's not sinking deep into my what? Heart. Oh, you're under conviction yet? I hope so. If you need it. If not, then just keep on doing the what? Right thing. Look at verse 14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age even to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. He said, you ought to have been moved on to the strong meat. What's strong meat? Strong meat is understanding the plan of God and growing to the place where you can take up your cross and deny your what? Self. Do you know why a lot of people can't apply doctrine? You know why they can't forgive? You know why they're bitter? You know why they're jealous? You know why they get full of fear? 
and anxiety and worry. You know why? Because it's all about who? See? It's all about what? Self. Strong meat means dying to self. That I am not going to respond to life the way I want to because that's how I feel at the moment. I'm going to respond the way what? God wants me to. But how can you do that if your mind is not thinking like God? Can you? No, no you can't. You're just going to go back to what you know. Right? If your mind is not thinking God's thoughts, if those thoughts aren't circulating and flowing through there all the time, and the only way those thoughts can sink in and flow through there all the time is if you are seriously focused daily on what? Renewing that mind. See, so this is a message about what? Renewing the mind. Spiritual growth starts with the Word of God and renewing the mind. And if I'm not doing it daily, guess what? I am, I, and you know, and I'm going to say something. I'm preaching this message, and I'm guaranteed as people right now, you're dull of hearing. You're thinking about something else. You want to be somewhere else. Right? And it, that only proves what? The principle. You're not taking what I'm saying seriously. You think you know better than God. Folks, part of growth means the humility to realize, I don't know everything. That's why God gave you a pastor. Right? And I need to learn from someone else who has walked the walk ahead of me and can lead me down the path. Now, let's continue on here because we got an issue with these, these believers, these Hebrews. They were not taking their spiritual growth seriously and they were becoming dull of hearing. And they were caught in Satan's snare. And they were on the cusp of a severe, severe chastisement in their life because they were about to make a decision that would bring that chastisement upon them. They were getting ready to go back to Judaism after having trusted Christ. And what's Hebrews all about? The whole epistle is about how Christ is better than Moses. How all the Old Testament is done away and there's a new what? Covenant. How that the sacrifice of the Lamb can't it was only a type that can't take away sins and Christ is the reality that does take away sin and that Christ's sacrifice never needs to be offered what? Again, his, his body was offered once for all and forever. So to go back and offer a sacrifice of the Lamb in the temple for your sins would be what? Tantamount to trampling all over the blood of Christ of crucifying Christ again. It's an insult to the Spirit of God's grace. Yet, in their baby stage of regression and being dull of hearing, they were now exposed to Satan's attacks and snares in such a way that they were about to make that kind of decision. Let's read verse 1. And, and before we get into this passage, let me just say this. Let me just back you up one second. going to give you a little bit more. <laughs> This is a passage that is one of the most misunderstood passages in the history of Christianity. And all those folks that teach you can lose your salvation and are legalistic take this passage and try to use it to prove you can lose your salvation. And this passage does not have anything to do with losing salvation. The passage in context is about spiritual growth and the failure of spiritual growth and the danger of what? Suffering severe chastisement from God. For what? For apostasy. For falling away from your what? Faith. Okay? That's what it's about. Being chastised severely because fire appears in the passage. You know, folks, you've got to take words in context. Every time fire appears in the New Testament is not a reference to hell. Okay? Fire, over in 1 Corinthians, we talk about the fire that's going to test our works to determine our reward. Is that hell? No. That's the fire of God's judgment or evaluation of our what? Works to see what quality they are. Fire here in this passage is a reference to how farmers burn fields. Okay? I, I, I never realized this stuff until I drove down you know, south years ago. And I'd be going by these tobacco fields, and I see, Dad, look, my dad, they're all, they're all burnt. What's that about? He says, well, I, I think, no, he didn't know that much, but he said, I think what they do is if the field ain't producing, they, they burn it, they let it sit for a while, then they can what? Replant it later, and, and it becomes fruitful. I, mean, I think that's what the principle was, something similar to that. But the point is, 
the fire here in the, that Paul's going to be speaking of is about how the farmer burns the field up so that it may be useful later. But it can only be useful if it goes through this terrible fiery burning. It's not hell. It's talking about God's what? Chastisement, which is designed to correct our lives. To correct our lives. Okay? So when you see fire, don't think hell right away. Look at the context. All right? Now, let's look at verse 1 here, chapter 6. It says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Now, is perfection there sinlessness? No. Perfection, if you look the word up, carries the connotation of being what? Complete or mature. What he's saying is to these spiritual babies, go forward and grow to spiritual maturity. Go from baby Christian to adult Christian. Go through the various stages of spiritual growth and mature in your faith in your walk with the Lord. Become an adult Christian. Go on. You're stagnant and you're going backwards, some of you, and the rest of you, if you don't get going forward, you're also going to go backwards. He said, let us go on to perfection. Let us begin to pursue our spiritual growth seriously again. Have you been stagnant? Have you been distracted by the world and the details of life? Have you become dull of hearing? Have you been going through the motions? Has your heart not been right? The message today is this. Let's get that spiritual growth jump started again. And how do I do that? Not by trying to get busy for the Lord, but by getting busy with time with the Lord. Do you understand what I'm talking about? And you can do that by being with your prepared pastor. I told you last week, your, next, your best friend next to Jesus is who? Pastor John. Pastor John. You say, uh, you don't know me that way. Why? Here's why. Because God put me here in your life to be the vessel to give you the knowledge and information of His Word and the principles of His Word that you need for your spiritual growth. Okay? You need to take advantage of that. You need to focus on His Word. Now notice, He said, let us go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. That means you have to learn that you're not saved by your what? Religious works. Okay? And you're saved by what? Faith. And this repentance is a change of what? Mind. It's leaving trying to work for your salvation what? behind and begin by faith to trust who? Christ. Right? And then verse 2, of the doctrine of baptisms, plural, and that doesn't mean baptism, okay, New Testament baptism, it means all the ritual washings. Remember the Jews? They had all kinds of washings that the priests went through. Those were baptisms. Again, baptism in the Bible doesn't always mean water either. Sometimes it does mean water, but we're not going to go there now. All right? There's the baptism of the cup, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of fire. Those have nothing to do with water. Baptism of Moses, nothing to do with water. But we're not going to go there now. And then it says, the laying on of hands, the, the purpose for that, the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Those are simple, basic doctrines, right? Basic doctrines. He says, you've got to move on from these and begin to grow. Now look at verse number three. And this we will do if God permit. Why? Because some of them had already got so backslidden. You know how it says over in... 2 Timothy chapter 2, that those that are caught in the snare of Satan may recover themselves if God peradventure will grant them what? Repentance. There's certain stages of backsliding where a believer can regress so badly and their heart can get so cold and they get, can get so entrenched in Satan's snares that they can't lift themselves out of it. And the only way that they can recover is if there is a move of God in their heart. Okay? And I don't claim to understand everything about that. All right? But, there, but, but and here it says, if God permits. And it could also mean this. Not only that they come, some of them had come so trapped and were actually in this condition that he's talking about now, but it could also be that they had come to the point where God had already decided in his mind, chastisement's coming. 
I was patient, I waited. Paul doesn't know that chastisement is not on its what? Way. See, the Bible says you reap what you sow. It says that God chastises. Sometimes you, you experience the consequences of your bad decisions and bad actions pretty swiftly. And sometimes it takes a long time, right? For whatever reasons God has. But here is a situation where Paul recognizes some of them may be so far gone that the only thing that's going to recover them is what? A move of God in their heart. And he also could be referring to the fact that, you know, if God permits, maybe God has decided, you know what? I'm not going to let you repent and get right now. I'm going to chastise you because that's how far gone you are. And you need it. And it's going to be severe. Okay? It gets quiet. <laughs> look. Do you, I mean, look, you know your heart, right? Are you that far gone? I mean, look, you know, come on. I mean, you know your heart. This doesn't bother me to read it. It bother me. I'm not expecting anything. You know, and that's not arrogance. I just know I, my heart's been right. And there's times I know when my heart's wrong, right? And the longer my heart's wrong, the more danger I am of what? Being chastised. You see? So all I can say is if the shoe fits, wear it. But if it doesn't, don't. You know? Now look at, look at, <laughs> look at verse 4. But look at this. Now check it out, right? It says, for it is what? Impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Now is he talking about Christians here? Absolutely. Notice. Listen, verse 5, And tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. He describes them. They were enlightened. That means what? Being born again. They tasted of the heavenly gift. They have salvation. Right? They were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit's what? Inside them. They tasted of the word of God and the powers of their age to come. They've experienced some supernatural things of God. These are believers. And yet something is going to be impossible for them. And here's what it is. Verse 6. If they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now let me caution you. The sin that he's talking about here, you can't commit. You say, why not, Pastor? I thought we could commit any sins anybody else could commit. To a degree, but no, you, this particular sin, can you go into a temple in Jerusalem and offer a sacrifice of an animal? Can you do that? No. So you can't commit this sin. But you could have the same attitude of heart that they had. You could be getting weary. You could be distracted by the world. You could be going through the motions and become dull of what? Hearing for whatever reasons. And instead of going forward, you're remaining a babe and you're starting to go what? Backwards. And you could have gotten so hardened in that position that you can't hear what... You know what's the strangest thing? Jeff? I, I've seen this with people. They're going through stuff and, and you're a friend or a brother in Christ and you can look and you can say, I think God's trying to tell them something. But they're just... Right? Go, 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 go. Right? They got a plan. They're on the move. They got an agenda. They're doing their thing. I want that man to get... Married, I want to marry that woman. I want that job. I want that career. Got to take care of that business thing. Got to go to school. Got to do this. Got to do that. Got that plane go. And God's trying to get their attention to show them something or direct them in another direction. But they're going. And stuff is getting harder and harder and harder and stressful and problem. They can't hear. God's speaking, but they cannot what? Hear. You know, not only does God speak through the preacher, God speaks through what? Circumstances sometimes. Now, not all the time, you know, but some, many times, right? But they can't hear. You see? And now it becomes impossible for God to get to them. And the only thing that's going to get their attention is some severe chastisement that comes on their life and is like getting hit with a bomb out of the what? Blue. You get, now look, don't get all nervous. Oh, God, I don't know what to, Look, don't... Look, where's your heart? 
That's all. Just ask yourself, where's my heart been? And if it ain't been right and the, and, and the bomb hasn't exploded yet, well, maybe there's still a chance to recover. And maybe you're doing great. Maybe this doesn't apply to you at all. You've been faithful. You've been hearing the word. You've been growing. You know you've been focused on the Lord. Your heart's not been backslidden and distracted. And you haven't been ignoring the word of God and the teaching of the pastor and dull of hearing. Then don't sweat it. Right? See, there's always a chance when you preach these things, people will apply them the wrong way. So I always have to stop and caution again because I realize that, like Paul said, you are my little children and I have to treat you that way so that you don't get, what, hurt and offended by something you shouldn't be and you don't stumble over something that you shouldn't be stumbling over. But for those of you that need it, I hope God just convicts the living hell out of you. Okay? So that you can avoid the severe chastisement that may be coming. Okay? You, you get what I'm talking about here? All right, now, the, the falling away that these folks could go to get involved is, notice it involved crucifying to themselves the Son of God, what? Afresh and putting him to an open shame. How would they crucify Christ afresh and put him to a shame? By going back to what? Judaism. Let me show you a verse. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 10, speaking of Christ, speaking of his sacrifice, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, what? Once for all, right? Go to verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. And here perfect means in the sense of completely what? Forgiven. The Old Testament sacrifices of the animals had to be repeated, right? Why? Because none of them was efficacious. None of them actually took away sin. It only provided a temporary covering that pointed to who? Christ, right? Did Christ's sacrifice once and for all deal with sin? Yes, it says in verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified, right? Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for what? all. That's the context here in Hebrew. Christ's sacrifice was perfect. It dealt with sin once for all. It never needs to be repeated. For those who believe sin has been what? Paid for and forgiven completely. But to go back to Judaism and to offer a sacrifice would be to crucify Christ what? Again, and say that his death on the cross did not finish the work. Just like Roman Catholicism does this morning all around all over the world. The Catholic priest says, I'm changing this wafer. Made over in, uh, who knows, in Nebraska, <laughs> Woonsocket, wherever. And this cup of wine, and this becomes the body and, and flesh and blood of Jesus. And then he lifts it up and says, Father, accept this what? Sacrifice. That he's offering another what? Sacrifice for the sins of what? Men. The Bible says there's one sacrifice offered once forever by Jesus Christ. And when he died on the cross, he said, it is finished, paid in full. Never needs to be what? Repeated. So anybody else who's repeating a sacrifice for sins is slapping God in the face. It is apostasy. It is abominable. It is blasphemy. And that's not me. That's the Bible, folks. Read it. Okay? And so now we go back to Hebrews. And this is the problem, Hebrews chapter 6, as we tie this together in the last seven, eight minutes here. We'll get to what this passage is talking about. These were saved people. And again, here's another example of how a believer can drop the shield of faith and become a spiritual shipwreck and apostatize. But thank God, the Bible says, if we believe not, he remains what? Faithful still. He cannot deny himself. See, one moment you believed in Christ as your Savior, he put his spirit in you. And he made a promise to you that if you believe that he'd never cast you out. So even if you stumble and bumble and fail, and even fail miserably and badly after that, God's never going to throw you out of his family. 
You're in his grace. He may have to correct you and chastise you and whoop you. And some Christians, he may say, you know what, enough of you being on earth. I'm taking you home to heaven early. But one thing you can never lose is your salvation. Okay? That is secure. All right? And we have to understand that background to this passage, to understand this passage. And what this passage is talking about is if you're becoming like these Hebrews, they were dull of hearing, they weren't making any progress, they were distracted, God couldn't get their attention, they couldn't hear the word, they couldn't hear what God was doing in their life to try to get their attention. Now he says it's impossible to recover them to repentance unless something happens we're going to see. Okay, let's see. Look, look over here. Verse number 7. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it and bringeth forth herbs or vegetation, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receives blessing from what? God. When the farmer plants, right, and waters, and the crops grow, produces what? Fruit, right? What did Jesus say in John chapter 15? That when we bear fruit, he purges us that we would bear what? More fruit, all right? God wants to produce fruit in our life. But if we're Christians who are saved, but we're not producing any fruit, any spiritual what? Growth. God will have to chastise us to get us corrected so we start producing spiritual fruit. You getting the picture here? Amen. And he's using the example of the farmer. Okay? And then he says, look at verse 8. But what happens when the, when the farmer doesn't, doesn't pro when he produces good fruit? Ah, oh, what a blessing from God, right? <laughs> right? But look at verse 8. What happens when there's what? Bad fruit. What about when you get rotten apples? Rotten tomatoes. Right? Bad cucumbers like I got this year. Right? Right? Squash don't want to grow. Right? <laughs> what do you do then? Right? <laughs> but look here. But that which beareth thorns and briars, right? All the weeds and the thorns is what? Rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. And that gets all people who don't understand the context all scared. Oh no! God's going to send them to hell. They get saved but they backslid. He's going to send them to hell. No, you're just ignorant of the Bible and the grace of God. Context. He's using the example. He says, what's the farmer do when the land produces weeds and thorns and bad fruit? He curses it by burning it. Burn it all up. Let it sit for a while, and then we can use it what? Again. That's the context, folks. You know how many, especially Pentecostals, they're good with this. I was Pentecostal for six years, so I'm no. A lot of them are safe folks and nice people, but false doctrine is false doctrine, folks. Okay? And you know how many messages I heard from Pentecostal pulpits from this passage telling believers that if they committed a sin... Or a, or a bad sin or a series of sins that this was going to happen and God was going to send them to hell and curse them and burn them up. That is not what the Apostle Paul is talking about. That is pitiful, what? Theology. That is being a pathetic Bible student. And that is also dangerous because it can put so much guilt and bondage and legalism upon what? Christians' lives. And rather growing in the love of their father they live in fear of him constantly. And are you going to be able to grow and get close to him if you're constantly in fear that if you did something wrong, he's going to burn you up in hell? I don't think so. So now look at verse 9. And Paul says, But beloved, we're persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though thus we speak. He says, look, just like the farmer has to burn up that field, God may have to send severe chastisement on some of you who have become what? Dull of hearing. Because you should be going forward to maturity. But all you're doing is going through the motions. You're hearing, but you're not hearing. Okay? And some have gotten so far that it's impossible to get them to repent. And the, what's the only thing that's going to get them to repent? A severe what? Chastisement. Just like the farmer. Listen, there's a point where a field isn't going to produce and the farmer realizes it. 
It's not going to produce like this. I got to do something severe to this field before I can make it what? Produce. You get the picture? I've tried to get this field to produce, but it doesn't bring forth anything except thorns and thistles, weeds, bad fruit. So I got to do something to this field that's very what? Radical and serious so that I can transform it and maybe make it what? Usable again. And Paul's using that to apply to the Christian life. If we're backsliding, we're becoming dull of hearing, if we're regressing, right? For these Jews, it was the danger of going back to Judaism, right? But we can apply the principle, we can still become dull of hearing, even though we're not going back to Judaism, right? And we're regressing so much, and our heart ain't right so much, that God says, the only thing I can do, there's no fruit being produced in their life, and they won't come to repentance this way. You know, the scripture says the goodness of God leadeth to thee to repentance. If God can't get you to repent by wooing you, by telling you of his love, of his grace, of his mercy, of his promises, then God will what? Get you to repent the hard way. Right? Isn't it better to just listen to the word and have your heart right and learn the easy way? And then make the changes in your life that are necessary. Get right in your heart and avoid the severe what? Chastisement. But God is so good that even if we won't hear and learn the easy way, because he loves us, because whom the Lord loveth, he what? Chasteneth. He will send the chastisement. And you know, some of us may have... Listen, I, I, I've experienced serious chastisement in my life as a young believer. I look back and it was a time in my life for about a year or two. It was like... It was like I was a Christian and saved, but it was like hell on earth. All right? It was hard. Because I was, I was going my way. I was out of God's will. I was doing things on my what? Terms. And God was speaking all along the way, but I wasn't what? I wasn't listening. He tried. And he, every step along the way, he tried to stop me, but I kept going. And I suffered for it. And it was painful. But I was like that field. Thank God I was able to recover because that's why I'm here today. You want to know, but there's some Christians who never what? Recover. They become shipwrecks. So folks, what does this tell us today? Sometimes the only way God can get us jump-started and moving in the Christian life is to what? Yeah, chastise us, right? Because that'll get our attention. Woohoo! Right? The pain, we won't go forward by the wooing of his love. Then he'll get us going forward by the rod of what? Correction that brings the pain. Right? But either way, he's going to try to get us going forward. And hopefully we won't despise the correction. Right? And we'll learn. So here's the thing this morning. Listen, don't become dull of hearing. Do, please, my brothers and sisters, we only are on, we finished point one now today. That's got, I said what I got to say about it. Please take your spiritual life seriously. Please, for your sake, take your spiritual growth seriously. And put aside time regularly, and daily, as best you can. I know there's times you can't. But over, over the long haul, be as faithful as you possibly can. And be focused. And be serious about your spiritual growth. Don't be satisfied to remain a spiritual baby because that's a snare of the what? Devil. Because if you remain a spiritual baby, eventually Satan will get you going what? Backwards. And that's where the problems really stop. You understand what I'm talking about? Amen? Amen. All right, let's bow our heads. Let's go before the Lord. Father, this morning we're grateful and thankful to have had this time to note and study these things from your word. My prayer is that you challenge our hearts to take what we've noted and studied, Lord, and to take it seriously, Lord, to really focus on our spiritual growth daily, Lord, to have that time with you, to hear your word, to learn of you, 
to focus on you. That we'd grow to be spiritual adults and not remain babes. We dedicate the last moment of the service this morning to anyone here if you're not saved. Jesus Christ died on the cross 2,000 years ago. He paid your sin debt. This morning he offers you the forgiveness of sins and eternal life if you will believe on him. Right now in the privacy of your own heart and your own mind you can tell God I know that I'm a sinner. But I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for my sins and rose again. And Lord Jesus I'm trusting you and you alone as my Savior and my Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved. Let's take a moment of silent prayer for anyone who wishes to trust Christ. Now, Father, this morning, if your Holy Spirit has spoken to anyone's heart and they've believed in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, my prayer is that you would give them assurance that you've forgiven them and saved them. And Father, pray that you'd reveal your love to them in a special way. And I ask that you lead them back to study your word, that they might grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning we pray for the offering, that you take that which is given and use it to further the teaching, the preaching of the gospel of the grace of God. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.